You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. The Al Court lynching exposes Pakistan's tryst with blasphemy. India reiterates concern on terrorist entities getting chemical weapons. And Afghanistan seeks urgent funds to avoid humanitarian disaster. Let's begin the show with Pakistan, which in recent times has experienced numerous socio-political incidents of violence, strangely all in the name of Islam. The brutal killing of a Sri Lankan national is the latest in a long list of such socially acceptable and religiously legitimized crimes in Pakistan. A report. <laughs> O Messenger of Allah. A crowd of thousands were raising this slogan as they killed and burnt a Sri Lankan national, accusing him of blasphemy. Pakistan's Sial court witnessed this bone-chilling case of barbarity when a fanatic mob gave cruel and unusual punishment to a factory manager, alleging that he had disrespected Quran. The deceased Priyantha Kumara, who was in his 40s, was working as the general manager of a garment factory in Punjab's industrial city. He allegedly tore a poster of the hardline Tehrik al Pakistan in which Quranic verses were inscribed. The supporters of Tehrik al decided to take revenge as Priyantha was a disbeliever for them. When Priyantha was being burnt by the Islamist mob, many thought it was just the right time to take selfies. Those who were involved in this inhuman act are boasting with pride how they set a mutilated body on fire. They demonstrate no fear of consequences for this murderous crime. This was not a human being set on fire. This was a nation setting itself on fire. The rampant killings in the name of blasphemy are ruining Pakistani society from within, giving validity to monstrous crime and human rights violations in the country. Many hardline Islamist groups instigate the youths to kill the so-called disbelievers, and those in power are giving space and legitimacy to these extremist groups, their narratives, and their politics. Last month, hardline Tehrik al Pakistan forced the government into allowing it to operate as a political party, even as the TLP's workers had killed several law enforcement officials in clashes. In recent years, the group has openly challenged Pakistan's foreign policy decisions and shown intent to take on the state without any hesitation. According to media reports, at least 75 people in Pakistan have been extrajudicially killed in connection with blasphemy allegations since 1990. The radical youths and supporters of Islamist organizations are using blasphemy law as a weapon to take revenge against minorities. But for Pakistan Defense Minister Parvez Khattak, these lynchings are the result of the youthful exuberance of Muslim youngsters who try to defend Islam. The dark days of General Ziya's brutality in Pakistan 
seem lighter today. State policies in the Muslim majority country have radicalized generations. The ruling dispensation is normalizing murders and mainstreaming radical groups. Until the policy of using religion for legitimizing and gaining power is changed, such violence will continue. Moving on, Pakistan continues to nurture and sponsor terrorists in its territory to use them as proxies against its neighbors. The aim is to create chaos and unrest in the region, especially in India's Jammu and Kashmir. It helps these guerrillas to infiltrate into Indian territory and target the military installations and civilians. However, the alert Indian security forces are eliminating these terrorists with a commitment to maintain peace and tranquility in the region. We have a report. The Indian security forces are carrying out a series of operations to uproot the network of terrorism from Jammu and Kashmir. The terror groups operating here have received a huge setback when three terrorists belonging to lashkar e taiba were recently eliminated in Kashmir's Shopian district. They were involved in several cases, including attacks on security forces and civilians. In the wake of recent spike in killings of civilians by Pakistan-backed terrorists, the security forces launched a major anti-terror crackdown. Unfortunately, the peace and development in Jammu and Kashmir frustrates Pakistan, and it makes all possible efforts to unleash chaos and violence in the region. The Indian Air Force chief recently said that Pakistan will continue to sponsor terrorism despite its economic weakness. On the Western Front, we continue to be in a no-war, no-peace situation. Pakistan is unlikely to shed its Kashmir-oriented strategy for the foreseeable future. Despite Pakistan's own internal problems and economic weaknesses, it will continue to sponsor terrorism. Pakistan's strategy of bleeding India by a thousand cut has been implemented by exploiting religious sentiments and whipping up passions on communal and sectarian lines. Terror groups like lashkar e taiba and jash e mohammed have been the Pakistani establishment's preferred tools towards fighting India in Kashmir. LED's agenda of wresting Kashmir from Indian control and joining it with Pakistan is compatible with the state's own strategic interest and it has provided extensive financial, logistical and military support to the group over the years. For much of the 1990s, LED operations were limited to Kashmir. It was only after 2000 that LET began conducting operations in other parts of the country. Fidayan attacks involving heavily armed militants launching large-scale attacks such as the ones on the Indian parliament in 2001 and in Mumbai in 2008 are the group's signature tactic. Over the years, Pakistan Army and ISI have used these terrorists to fight a proxy war against India. The Pakistani armed forces have formulated the new concept of war fighting and what they call the triple R, re-articulate, reorganize and relocate, with an aim to stymie the Indian strategic gains. Towards this, Pakistan has continued to acquire and equip itself with latest technology, aircraft as well as upgrade its air defense capabilities. Strategically, they are making the transition from fighting a predominantly defensive war to adapting a more aggressive approach for an offensive defense under the nuclear umbrella. Changing warfare techniques have posed numerous challenges for the security forces who are engaged in anti-terror operations. The Indian security forces are fully committed to bring peace in the Kashmir Valley by dismantling propaganda machinery of Pakistan in the region. With millions facing starvation and nearly the entire population teetering on the brink of poverty, Afghanistan is facing the worst humanitarian crisis. The international community has yet to recognize the militant group as Afghanistan's de facto rulers. In a bid to stop the hardline Islamists from accessing the money, world's leading powers have cut off funding which has led to a collapse in public finances. A report. Amid increasing terrorism and humanitarian crisis, Afghanistan is battling to survive. An issue that is causing immediate concern after the Taliban takeover is the country's profound financial crisis. 
Recently, Afghanistan's national currency fell to a record low after losing over 5% of its value in one day. The Afghani was traded below 100 for one US dollar for the first time since being issued 20 years ago. Some Afghan experts attribute the continuous devaluation to the freezing of the country's 7 billion US dollars in foreign reserves by the United States. Another reason behind the sharp decline is the rising concern that Afghan banks could collapse. The Kabul-based Maiwan Bank, one of the country's five largest commercial banks, has failed to make foreign currency exchanges for almost three weeks. The drastic currency fluctuation has drawn complaints from many merchants who are worried about the unstable situation. Well, um, و پول مردم افغانستان است و ما ای خواهش میکنیم که دی مورد دنیا هم در در مربوطی از قضیه بر مردم افغانستان کمک خدا باید بکنه The deteriorating situation in Afghanistan represents an ongoing security threat far beyond its borders stability both political and financial is certainly in the best interests of the people of Afghanistan and everyone else. In a war-torn country, job opportunities are limited, which has affected the finances of people. Many households in Afghanistan are struggling to meet their basic food needs. And in such a crisis, women cannot support their families as they are still banned from public services jobs in many sectors. Afghan women think they are losing battle to remain visible under Taliban. Ida kam wajiyat ki hamra isana ahtiyar kardan ma fikr mikram ko bas zana ina reh ma ana mikran. Umit mikram ki har qadar zutar mitanan dasat atay khud tagirat musbat biran wa siyasat shon wazi ashawa ki siyasat dakhli shon chie siyasat kharidi shon chie as ta ik mardam diga azi yalat gangsi gichi baran ki na me faman ki Afghanistan ba kudam taraf rawan as. The Taliban's human rights record, in particular with respect to women and ethnic minorities, shows the reluctance of the international community to legitimize the regime. No one wants to fund the Taliban regime. But the Afghan civilians should not be punished for the actions of a regime brought upon them by force. Denial of financial support could affect the Afghan people for generations to come. India has always raised its voice against enemies of humanity like terrorism. It always shows deep concerns over proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery systems. Recently, at the UN Security Council, the nation reiterated its concern regarding the possibility of terrorist groups and individuals gaining access to chemical weapons. We take a look. A chemical weapon is a specialized munition that uses chemicals formulated to inflict death or harm on humans. In modern warfare, chemical weapons were first used in World War I. In the years since then, chemical arms have been employed numerous times, most notably in the Iran-Iraq War and the Syrian Civil War. These weapons of mass destruction have caused more than 1 million casualties globally. After September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks in the United States, there is a high-risk perception of possible terrorist attacks with chemical weapons. India has time and again expressed deep concern over the proliferation of such weapons and their delivery systems that would endanger peace and security. Recently, at the United Nations Security Council briefing on Syria, India reiterated its concern regarding the possibility of terrorist groups gaining access to chemical weapons. As a member of this council, India has been repeatedly cautioning against the possibility of terrorist entities and individuals gaining access to chemical weapons, including entities in the region. The latest reports of UNITAD have also brought out these connections. These linkages are a cause for concern and need to be acted upon. 
Lastly, Mr. President, we believe that technical issues such as Syria's chemical weapons file need to be dealt with in an objective manner. Progress on these matters could potentially help the political track move in a positive direction. Chemical weapons have been used in warfare and terrorist attacks a dozen times or more in the last three decades, causing horrific human suffering. Al-Qaeda, Afghan insurgents, ISIS and others continue efforts to steal or produce deadly chemical agents for indiscriminate terrorist attacks. These current threats underline the central importance of global security of ridding the world of chemical weapons. On many occasions, India has strongly condemned the use of chemical weapons. New Delhi holds the view that there can be no justification for their use. India is against the use of chemical weapons by anybody, anywhere, at any time and under any circumstances. We have consistently maintained that any investigation into the use of chemical weapons must be impartial, credible and objective, following scrupulously the provisions and procedures embedded in the Convention and in conformity with the delicate balance of power and responsibility enshrined in it to establish facts and reach evidence-based conclusions. India had started UN Security Council term vowing to speak against terror. Since then, New Delhi is speaking for the developing world and it has tried to bring in human-centric inclusive solutions to matters of global peace and security. India has consistently prevented efforts to dilute focus on terrorism and it will continue to strengthen the efforts to combat global terrorism. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at nin.com. This is Shreya Savajay signing off on the behalf of entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. You're watching Tag TV.